Welcome to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Andres Martinez. I'm the editorial director of Future Tense and a professor of practice at our Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. Future Tense is actually a collaboration between a ASU, uh, New America, the Think Tank, and Slate Magazine. Um, and this is our latest social distancing social. So I'm really honored to be doing this one in collaboration with the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center. Uh, <clears throat> been a longtime fan of the Mexico Institute. We've done things together in the past. And for those of you, a lot of you probably know that if you're interested in all things happening in Mexico and, and having a, an honest broker in terms of a place for analysis and, and to bring people together who care about the bilateral relationship, uh, <clears throat> you'll never walk alone having the Mexico Institute there. And so, uh, and I had to phrase it just that way because Duncan Wood, who is a very able leader of the Mexico Institute, is a, is a huge uh, Liverpool fan. Um, and also, I should uh, give a shout out and plug an important webinar that the Mexico Institute is hosting tomorrow, uh, U.S.-Mexico cooperation during the drug pandemic. Uh, I believe it's with Comexi in Mexico as well. Um, and that is a conversation with, with uh, Chris Landau, the current... Uh, U.S. ambassador in Mexico City. So this is, uh, in some ways, an appetizer to that conversation, and, and maybe uh, I can I can pry away from Carlos and, and Alejandra some uh, some advice for the U.S. ambassador in Mexico. So, and I believe that's the same time tomorrow, um, different channel. So, uh, you know, go to the Mexico Institute page to to RSVP if you haven't already. So today I'm joined by two of my favorite people and two of the smartest people I know. And those two things don't always <laughs> overlap, but it's, it's, it's fantastic when they do. Um, Alejandra Haas and Carlos Bravo Regidor, both of whom are now at CIDE um, so <clears throat> as of a recent past. And so that's an, another nice sort of uh, symbiotic thing because we, we, at ASU we've done some great collaborations with CIDE. But I'm very excited to, to check in with both of you on the current, uh, uh, let's just say a tragic situation in terms of the pandemic and what it means for Mexico for the bilateral relationship uh, today and going forward. Um, so I've been really looking forward to this and thank, thank you both for, for doing this with us. I know, I know you're both really busy, so welcome. Oh, thank you. Uh, Alexandra, I wanna start with you on a topic that um, predates the pandemic because typically uh, the way that our uh, media cycles operate now, uh, especially if you're sort of uh, of my tribe and Carlos's tribe of coming from the journalism world, people tend to have very short attention spans and we tend to move on to the next thing that, you know, the next shiny object that, that grabs our attention, the big story. Obviously, the, the story of the pandemic is the biggest story of our lifetimes, perhaps. Um, Probably, and it's and in its universality, if nothing else, it, it's so it's it's a little bit understandable. But pre-pandemic, we were already very concerned about um, a humanitarian tragedy in terms of migration, and I, you know, this was something that consumed a lot of our attention. You were heading CONAPRED, Mexico's Federal Commission to Combat Discrimination. We had some. I had the the good fortune to collaborate with with some of your team on on looking at discrimination and, and how media was covering the story of Central American migrants making their way through Mexico towards the United States. There was a, a spike in, in that migration. Um, and that was, you know, that was a big story in 2018, 2019. And then with this, the advent of the pandemic, it's the, it's the type of story that we, we tend to shrug off and move on. And I, I just wanna open the conversation by talking a little bit about um, the latest development on that front, how the pandemic has impacted it. And then I think it's also a nice way to segue into a conversation about how the US and Mexico work or don't work together on shared challenges and opportunities. And that was an interesting uh, case study because it was a sort of, a, it was a shared challenge and it wasn't the classic, you know, what are we gonna do about Mexicans trying to cross the border? It was two countries dealing with, with this influx of people uh, coming in from Central America for, for reasons that you might be familiar with. Um, so I wanna start there, if you could just pick up the thread on that 2019 story. 
Sure. Um, so thank you, Andres, and thank you to ASU and Future Tense. Um, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I also want to say hi to my friends at the Mexico Institute in, in Washington, um, and to Carlos Bravo, of course, always a pleasure seeing you. Um, so yeah, I think the context of migration is a context that we need to look at, uh, as you say, from before what, uh, what's happening now. Um, what we saw is these caravans that came into Mexico from Central America, people in Central America increasingly in conditions that were unlivable there and looking for a better future. Also some talk of some organized caravans and some people trafficking, which is something that hasn't necessarily been proven. But at least, I mean, when I went to the southern border in Mexico, in Tapachula in two, 2018, to see the first caravan come into Mexico and walked with them for a bit, um, these were genuine people that were looking for, for, for a better opportunity, like Mexicans have been going to the US for, for so, such a long time and humans move around the world for the same reasons. And so, um, the, the, whole, the whole year and a half, let's say, from, from 2018 to, let's say, the early months of 2020, we saw three, let's say, three different types of answer to the caravans from Mexico. The first was the previous administration who basically said, just get to Tijuana and do what you can. Right, and so it was kind of uh, an, an open border without saying it openly, right. but it was de facto what was happening. Also, they were sending some buses to take people from the southern border to the northern border because they didn't want to ha anything to happen on the way. Uh, Mexico is quite an unsafe place for, for my, uh, undocumented migrants. Um, but they, but, but the government, federal government didn't get involved. And so that was answered with, by the new administration with a very strong uh, response, a very different response to the previous administration. And for the first six months, there was a, a humanitarian response that was very robust and a totally different policy, which was responding by giving out humanitarian visas to people that needed them. Uh, although the humanitarian visas were not used as humanitarian visas by by the migrants, most of them used them as a as a conduit as a, a, a conduit to just to cross Mexico and to get to the northern border. In the month of May or June last year, we saw a huge change in that in 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 the opposite direction, uh, with, with the United States taking some strong positions against uh, Mexico, letting migrants go through. And uh, what we saw was Mexico responding quite uh, strongly to that and putting the Guardia Nacional, which is a new, let's say, a new police force that also includes military uh, on the southern border in Mexico. So that precedes the pandemic. We've seen in other countries in Latin America some militarization of borders, I have to say. For example, the border between Colombia and Venezuela, the border of Costa Rica also, the, the frontier of Costa Rica also has, a, has some military presence. So um, this is not something that is only happening in Mexico, but maybe Mexico uh, is, is a you know, we've seen what a, a military, militarized border looks like in terms of human rights violations because we started before the pandemic. It's not something as new as other countries in Latin America. Um, so what we are seeing right now is, um, I guess, I, I, I'm very surprised by these two kinds of approaches to the pandemic. So the closing off, absolute, absolute closing off of the US and these declarations that all um, non-migrants need to not go into the US, uh, plus the review that President Trump has said that needs to be done by all agencies and all programs to see if they maintain the mobility programs or not, which is quite a strong uh, measure and strong language. And it's something that he said 60 days and can be extended to 60 more days and that means or it can be extended for forever this is this is something that we need to take into account and it's that although this is a is a it's a it's a, a moment of emergency a lot of these measures in terms of migration are going to stay and are going to be the new normal for the migration system around the world um, sure. there's a lot to say about the European Union closing off its borders I mean I think there's a lot to talk about in terms of the world order and what this new normal means in terms of uh, you know the conditions in which we were a year and a half ago when we had a an international compact or pact for mig migration that had another logic right right uh, 
but on the other hand, and, and I can finish with this uh, because I'd love to hear Carlos and, or yourself. On the other hand, there's these things like um, people that do work in hospitals or hospital work or, or people that are in areas like agriculture. A lot of them are uh, un, uh, undocumented migrants, particularly in agriculture. They're putting food on America's tables, uh, but at the same time, they're seen as the enemy. So this is... This is something that also not only the U.S. has to grapple with. Um, Argentina, for example, has been um, enacting some executive orders to have medical doctors or, or nurses uh, have a revalidation of their, that are not Argentinian, that are not allowed to exercise their profession in Argentina, to have sort of a quick process to, to make them able to work legally in Argentina. And this is, and, and they're looking for other places, Cuba is sending doctors everywhere. I mean, the, the needs that arise from this pandemic are changing the way in which we relate to each other, uh, much more so in terms of xenophobia and political discourse that is anti-migration on the one hand, but on the other hand, it's also putting on the table how much we actually depend on each other and depend also on the work of people that are in other countries that have the expertise, the possibilities, the knowledge, or even just by demographics, the needs that some countries have of having people of a certain age come in and work in those countries. So I think a lot of confusion there still, uh, but a lot of worrying measures in, t in terms of human rights as well. Yeah, that was, that was a, a, a really great overview and, and way to kick us off. And you know, we, we, we threw borderlands, this concept into the title of this conversation and, and some, somewhat amorphous almost on purpose because it, it feels like it, it's not clear whether the, the porousness of the border of borders and, and sort of the concept of globalization and also the concept of our two countries getting ever closer, regardless of whatever political moment we're living through, whether that's all gonna be sort of up for review. Um, and, and on the question of essential workers, I have to give a shout out to our friend, uh, Alfredo Corchado wrote uh, a lovely, um, essay, kind of very personal essay in the New York Times about if they're, I think the headline was if, if they're essential, they're not illegal. And, it, and you know, these moments do remind us of our, uh, our societal reliance and dependence on, on people that we sort of, uh, you know, uh, I don't wanna say lure, <laughs> but uh, encourage to come work for us. Uh, we depend heavily on them. We don't, in many cases, pay them what, what their labor is worth and we haven't modernized our immigration system to give them uh, legal status. And there's a long standing sort of hypocrisy on that, but that's my, my editorializing for the day. But just quickly on the, on the, on the flow of, of, of migrants coming from Central America, just, just to close that loop, have we seen, had the numbers already started to, to taper down? Is, is, and with all of this, is, there, is the tendency for people to be, to sort of stay in place for the moment or what, what's current, do you have a sense of what's currently happening on, on say the Mexico Southern border these days? Yeah, so I think uh, there's a couple of, of data points that are useful. One is that uh, the, um, the, the migrants from Central America that were sent to Mexico to wait for their uh, status, their asylum status of the asylum seekers, are down to seven a day when they were two or 300 a day a few months ago. So I think that's a data point that is, is useful. The flows are, are, are much lower. Um, and that's also due to, first of all, because of the stay at home and the militarization as well, but also because the, the albergues, the, the um, how do you say albergues in English? I just forgot. Uh, the, it's the like place. the homes where for for migrants, right? Yeah, where where civil society and and, and shelters. A lot, sorry, shelters. 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 The shelters that are uh, mostly civil society or or ca the Catholic Church, uh, ma many almost all of them are closed. I mean, they were. It was very hard for them to deal with the pandemic and having also an overflow of people there. So the flows are are less much less but also one thing that we have to know is that these are people that are, a lot of them are leaving from situations that were already dire that you know motivated by violence or by the need to eat and that's not going to stop with the pandemic that's probably going to 
be worse. So even if we see less of a flow right now, I think we can anticipate that the flow is going to become larger or bigger, and it's going and the flows are going to take more dangerous routes because right. of the closing off of the borders. So I think the pandemic makes it uh, worse. The condition, the economic conditions are going to get worse all over the globe. I mean, recession is is everywhere. Um, I don't know that violence is going to get any better. I mean, there were some speculation that crime was going to go down, but I'm not sure it's going to be the case, at least in the medium and long term. Right. And at the same time, if you close borders and have more militarization on, on all of those, of those borders in Central America and the different countries, Mexico and then the US, uh, you're just going to make migrants take different routes. So I think even if right now the flows are less, that's not necessarily a trend that's going to continue for a long time. Right, right. Carlos, I, I want to bring you in on this on this immigration question, you know, uh, address it however you like. But I also um, added to that, uh, you know, if you could help us sort of put it in a, in a political context in terms of how our two countries, uh, North American neighbors of Mexico and the United States um, are collaborating. And, and th again, this has sort of been a, an, an interesting case study for the um, I would call it, you know, curious uh, relationship between Donald Trump and Andres Manuel López Obrador. And sometimes there's a danger in personalizing governments, but these are obviously two real characters in the full sense of the word. And, and I think their governments are, are a reflection of their personalities and their instincts. And there was a huge expectation when uh, my tocayo López Obrador came into office in late 2018 that the relationship was going to uh, turned sour. There had been a lot of criticism in Mexico that uh, his predecessor hadn't stood up to Trump enough. You know, when 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 Trump would would tweet, you know, nasty things about Mexico or Mexicans. And so uh, I, you know, I think there's been a, a, I mean, to my from this side of the border, uh, it's 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 been somewhat surprising the extent to which, um, however, the, despite their personal idiosyncrasies, they seem to have found a a working relationship. It's not necessarily the most uh, sophisticated, mature uh, dialogue between heads of state, uh, because reflecting the domestic politics and so on. But on, you know, as Alejandra alluded to, when there were moments when Washington ex exerted pressure on Mexico City to, uh, you know, uh, help the U.S., you know, from Washington's perspective, deal with this. Uh, López Obrador's government response was not to necessarily, you know, stand up to the Americans or stick it to the Americans the way I think had maybe been and maybe it was ill-founded, but an expectation early on, there has been a way in which they've collaborated. And then recently, uh, there have been other examples of they, you know, you hear of phone calls and, and they're pleasant, they're amicable. Um, it's, a, it's just sort of been an interesting dance to watch. There was this whole oil summit recently where they made uh, a side deal where Trump kind of helped out Mexico and OPEC stuff. And so it's kind of a broad, observation that I, I just would welcome your wisdom or insight in terms of how I'm supposed to think about the way in which our governments and 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 uh, heads of state are working together because obviously in this moment it's it's super important that we have close uh, collaboration uh, whether it's on the challenges posed by migrants coming from third countries or uh, the crisis of the of the moment that we're living uh, well uh Again, th thank you so much for, for having us. It's, it's such a treat always to, to do things with Future Tense and with ASU. Uh, so I'm, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I want to pick up on something that, that uh, my colleague Alexandra mentioned. I, I think it's quite, uh, quite remarkable in terms of how to understand the impact of the pandemic on you know, the, the bilateral relationship, but all, I think also like the impact on larger uh, general dynamics of the new, the new migration configuration, so to speak, that was already you know, shifting and, and was already taking place before the pandemic. I, I think that on the one hand, we, we are seeing a clash of forces uh, that may somehow be represented on the one hand by the caravans and on the other hand by the wall. I, th I think the contrast between those two, uh, those two images, on the one hand, movement from the south to the north, 
because of unbearable living conditions and because of course of the hope you know for a, you know for a better life that is the engine uh, one way or another for for all, all of these people that are tr trying to you know get away from from their countries and you know try to to find a new place to start a new life uh, that's on the one hand and on the other hand what the wall represents uh, in terms of you know being just a barrier for that movement and a denial of an opportunity a denial of that hope for a for a better life um, I, I think we should take stock of the fact that in the context of a pandemic like this, in the context of an emergency and all the politics of fear that somehow end up, uh, you know, uh, winning the, the, the moment, uh, you know, the, the logic of the wall will probably, uh, you know, win over the logic of the caravans. Um, because, well, we know that there is an authoritarian temptation. We've seen it all across the board, not, not only in, in, the, in the border between the Mexico and the US, there is an authoritarian temptation, of course, to turn the pandemic into a sort of confirmation mm -hmm. that people coming from abroad represent some sort of threat or some sort of danger. Uh, in the US, that has been elaborated, particularly you know, in terms of crime and also probably in terms of culture. Uh, they didn't share our values or uh, you know, they come here and they are you know, seizing our resources, they don't pay taxes and they're prone to crime. Uh, of course, both, both, uh, both accounts very questionable, very problematic, uh, but still you know, very, uh, very effective in many ways to sort of give credence to anti-immigration sentiments or anti-immigration policies. Uh, so we see that on the one hand, I think, and I mean, it's sad, but it's true. Uh, Alfredo Corchado's piece you were just mentioning, Andres, I think one of its key features or one of its most persuasive arguments is precisely how the pandemic, and this touches upon something that Alexander was saying too, how the pandemic forces us to reckon with the other side of migration, with how immigrants are really contributing and you know, in many ways, in immigrants in the US right now, undocumented immigrants, are feeding Americans while they are in their houses. Uh, it's an occasion, of course, for a sort of a humanitarian soul searching uh, and you know, the need to recognize how, how much we depend on each other, regardless of our, of our immigration status or our country of origin or the color of our skin. Uh, but in, in the clash between these forces, uh, what I see is, you know, the, the, the forces represented by the wall uh, be becoming stronger because of the opportunities created by the, by the emergency and the politics of fear that follow. Uh, you were talking, and, and I, I want to I dwell into this, you were talking about the curious relationship between our two heads of state, Donald Trump and Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador. And I, I think this, this occasion, you know, shows us very clearly uh, a contrast between them. I mean, both are one way or another characterized as populists, although there are a lot of differences between them. I mean, yes, we, I think we, we can all agree that you know, somehow they resemble in certain things, uh, but there, there was one key difference that in this context becomes very, very visible and very salient, which is the following. Uh, the kind of populism that Donald Trump represents is a populism of exclusion regarding you know, uh, the other. You know, in this case, immigrants, you know, the populism that, that Donald Trump represents is very hostile towards foreigners, towards women, towards minorities, right? It's, it's a sort of populism in which the people are defined in a way that you trace a line of exclusion uh, you know, regarding immigrants in this case. Uh, this, this is the, the, the sort of subject I'm most interested in right now, right? where Lopez Obrador's brand of populism is much more uh, inclusionary. You know, Lopez Obrador's populism is a populism about not necessarily the nation uh, in racialized terms as Trump, although there are some uh, contents like that, but you know, it's a populism of the underdogs, of the downtrodden, of the forgotten. You know? It's a populism that wants to include these large sectors of, of the population that have feel excluded 
for a really long time, given the economic model, given the politics, given the prevailing culture, uh, etc. So in this case, it's interesting because when we look at how that contrast between this inclusion and exclusion populism has taken form in the bilateral relationship, well, what we see is that Lopez Obrador, Lopez Obrador's government had a very interesting, ambitious, and innovative agenda uh, in terms of migration at the very beginning of his government. You know, uh, there was even an, an, a very surprising and very welcome appointment for the head of the National Immigration Institute. He, this was a, a migrantologist, you know, a very, very recognized, very well regarded. And they, they started putting together a policy that really contrasted with, on the one hand, the policy that Mexico had had regarding Central America with the Peña Nieto administration and the so-called Plan, uh, Plan Frontera Sur. Uh, but it, on the other hand, it was very contrasting with Trump's immigration policy. Sure. And when push came to shove, uh, the United States made very clear, very openly clear, very aggressively clear, that they were not going to put up with this change of policy regarding the fact, you know, that they were respectful of the new government. And, you know, well, we, we all know this, this episode, Trump came out and threatened, uh, you know, to impose uh, a new tariff on Mexican goods in the border if Mexico didn't do more to stop the caravans and stop the migration flow. What's interesting, of course, is that in spite of how strongly the democratic uh, victory of Lopez Obrador was, of course, the force of those democratic votes or that democratic support was not enough to say no to Donald Trump's threat. Mm -hmm. And the Mexican government, you know, really shifted and really veered very aggressively. And, and then, you know, it was the, the National Guard, the new body, you know, meant to fight drug criminals was put to work to stop immigrants. Uh, of course, I mean, in a way, this is not new. The United States has always been the Mexico, Mexico's presidential power, you know, a sort of a, what we call a real factor of power. Regarding of the checks and balances system, you know, or, or you know, the, the democratic opposition, you know, it's just a force to be reckoned with. Uh, what, was, what was new, I think, or different in this episode was how aggressive and how open, uh, you know, Donald Trump intervened to actually force a policy change regarding migration from Central America. Uh, so I, I think that the, the pandemic, the, the context created by the pandemic will reinforce somehow uh, this dynamic. And this also forces us to, to deal with something in the Mexican context that I, I think we have been pushing or trying to overlook for a really long time. Uh, for, you know, we used to tell ourselves somehow the tale that we were, you know, uh, not good with our Central American brothers because the Americans were forcing us to somehow uh, outsource their migration policy, right? But I think what we have seen in the last year and a half, uh, you know, in the media, in the polls, is that there is indeed a sort of anti-immigrant feeling in Mexico as well. And even that the, that the shift in the policy of the new government, you know, had popular support. Uh, somehow we Mexicans didn't like it when Trump's anti-immigrant rhetoric right. was anti-Mexican. But, you know, we're okay when it doesn't mean Mexico, but Central Americans. Uh, this is, you know, something that I think we still haven't really reckoned with and done, you know, the appropriate soul searching it deserves. But at the same time, I think that with the pandemic, there, there will be an occasion for that feeling somehow to consolidate. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And, and by the way, I, I wasn't trying to suggest that the two leaders I mean, are getting along because they are similar. I, I do see some similarities, uh, but obviously they're, they're, their worldviews are very different. They come from very different places. It's always, it, it is, it, you know, and this term populist, as you well describe, is, um, is used very loosely and, mm -hmm. and, and the definitions are very loose. Um, I think, but I do think one of the things that they have in common um, is uh, they, they govern very much relying on their instincts. Um, mm -hmm. And, and, the, and that the, the part of the, I think the, way, the reason why the, this label of populist gets thrown around is, is there's, 
they're, they're, they both seem equally suspicious coming again from very different places and ha having very different motives. Um, they both, I feel, are, are suspicious of, of technocratic expertise yes. that they in some way feel is, is, uh, is undemocratic, you know, the, because it, it's, it's a buffer between them and their base and the people. Um, and so that's an interesting similarity. And also there's, I think they are both, again, in, with seeking very different things, they both, I think, are, are nostalgic, the politics of nostalgia, right? They, they, I think they're both yearning to take countries, their respective countries back to- Yeah, backward looking. A yes. better past, you know, and trying to reclaim something. And that, that's, that resonates obviously with people. And so, but because of all the differences, that's why I would just certainly describe Anytime they can, they can agree to anything as, as improbable. Although, as you, as you said, it's, they're not necessarily acting on a leverage playing field. And, I, and, and, um, and particularly going forward, it's going to be interesting to see how that relationship changes in light of the, the very serious challenges that I think Mexico will face on the economic side. And I think you were alluding to that, you know, when, when you rely so heavily on remittances, oil receipts, tourism, you know, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, everybody's taking a big hit, but, um, that's that's got to be very worrisome if you're uh, if you're Lopez Obrador. Uh, but one one thing I wanted to to ask both of you to come back to is um, you you quite eloquently describe how you know there there's nothing like a pandemic to empower those who were already predisposed to build moats around your you know your people your country or build walls I guess would be more the more appropriate. Although I think there was a there was one time when he had somebody look into moats, but um, but walls or you know pull up the drawbridges as they used to do in, in the Middle Ages when there was a plague, um, and and to blame the outsider as you described, and and that could certainly be alarming uh, in terms of what it might mean for the bilateral relationship. On the other hand, um, maybe this is naive, but if I were optimistic, th there is an argument that part of the aftermath of the pandemic is going to be to try to, you know, shorten our supply lines and, and be less reliant um, than we here now being the United States, but I think this is part of the, the discourse we're going to see in, on this side of the border, to become less reliant on China as our manufacturing base. Um, and so uh, while there are people in the U.S. administration who like you know, bashing Mexico as a as a as a as a sort of go to scapegoat when when necessary, uh, the relationship with China is going to be, if if anything, more complicated, and and probably more poison going into an election season, especially given, you know, this accusation of of the pandemic's origins and all this, you know, stuff. Um, so I wonder, you know, if if there might be a shift whereby, um, you know, the 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 USMCA region and, and the, the economic interdependence that we have in North America, you know, could be fortified a little bit vis-a-vis -vis like the relationship we, we have with, with China. I don't, I don't know if that like spills over into uh, the political realm or if it's simply like every nation for itself, forget about whatever your trading block happens to be. But it's, it's kind of an, an interesting thing to speculate on. And there's been, there's some, there've been some really interesting uh, reporting in, in the Washington Post and the New York Times and a lot of the papers and just in the last week on this, this issue of uh, US companies who do rely for some of their supplies from Mexican you know, plant, plants that, manufacturing facilities they have in Mexico uh, to supply, you know, this is the case of the Department of Defense, but also a lot of medical suppliers. And they feel like some of the essential goods they need in this moment of a pandemic they need that the cross border um, back and forth with trade uh, to continue, and yet some of the state, the, gov the governors in some of these Mexican states were were closing down these plants, and so they're you know it was like the governor of Chihuahua or Nuevo León or whatnot might have not considered these plants essential that need to be open, but the but the the HQ and the U.S. side felt that it was, and that was kind of an interesting tension that goes into you know how much interdependence can we really have cross borders, you know, at any level, whether it's right next door in Mexico or whether it's China. Um, so it's, it's uh, I think migration is, is one subject where this really plays out in the most vis visceral uh, human way um, in terms of the human element. But, but Alexandra, maybe uh, both of you can address this question of whether as things shift and maybe, you know, the, the US 
both on the corporate side and on the political side are going to be less des desiring of relying so heavily on China, whether that might uh, be an opportunity for this region, or is that just me being too naive? <laughs> well, I mean, my thoughts are quite pessimistic, but um, I, I would say, I mean, economic opportunism is going to be used in any case. Um, but I think what we have to break from is the age old idea that international trade is good for peace because actually what we've seen is, is President Trump using weaponizing international trade for other purposes, right? And I also think, and that's something that Mexico has to deal with, um, and it's that it's such an unbalanced economic relationship that was dependent on a good real political will from the US. But what we've seen right now is that our space to negotiate is quite small uh, in reality, because we have so much to lose uh, in terms of, of the economy if we would say no to things that are asked by the government of the US. So I would, I would, ask, uh, I would ask another question to both of you, which is, I mean, how can we trust that trade will be a vehicle for, let's say, social, cultural integration? Uh, because if you want to say, well, are trade relations going to be strengthened by this? Maybe, you know, maybe, yes. Maybe it's going to be a strategy for the US to take Mexico and Canada and say, look, guys, you're going to build stuff for us and we're not going to buy anything from China. Maybe that's going to happen. Whether that will mean be a better life for Mexican workers. I mean, what the, the last example that you gave is quite the contrary. I mean, yeah. these companies that are making people go and some of them have two, three, four thousand people working in the plants, uh, they're exposing their workers to very, very dangerous situations without, right. without appropriate measures for, for sanitation, but also with, a, with a, a view that the workforce is quite disposable. I mean, if these people don't take that job, somebody else will because they pay better than other working conditions in Mexico, but they also make a profit because they pay less than in other, let's say, more developed countries. So, I mean, my question is, okay, you might have a strengthened trade relationship, but who is that going to, who is going to get any benefit from that when the imbalance is so pronounced? And I mean, I'm not... I'm not a deterrent of, of free trade or any, I, I haven't been historically opposed to, to the North America as an economic region, on the contrary. But that was when I also thought that, that that meant that societies were going to be better off. My question is with these positions where you, you are actually dividing these two topics and you're targeting the, peop the people inhabitants of one country and targeting them in your political discourse, but also in the way that you treat them once they're in your territory. Um, my question is, yeah, okay, trade, but to what effect? Well, that's a really sobering note of realism because um, uh, a lot of us champions of the bilateral relationship, you know, have been very excitedly trying to inform people and, and tout the fact that there were, there, you know, there, there have been years recently, I think 2019, 2018, and some months where Mexico was the number one trade partner of the United States, which a lot of Americans don't, don't realize. And so we would reach this, this pinnacle of this trading relationship. And as you said, like, given all the classic things that, you know, economists would like us to believe in free traders, like that meant that the, the relationship should be more harmonious than ever. And when we were talking about the threats that the Trump administration uh, leveled at, at the Mexican government last year around the migration question, it was a threat of, of tariffs. Like, okay, so now you depend on this trade, guess what? So I, I, I do hear you. Um, so Carlos, help us out and you can uh, answer uh, Alexandra's great question. I'm afraid that I, 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 I am on the side of the pessimistic team as well. Uh, so you're on your own, Andres. <laughs> uh, but uh, w I mean, I, I I agree with everything. I might trade Alexandra teams, said. you know, <laughs> because you guys are too persuasive. Yeah, come to this side. We have cookies. Um, <laughs> I, I also think that there's another there's another element to be to be uh, mentioned, which is uh, USMCA. Uh, you know, one of the things, one of the most uh, remarkable things in which you know NAFTA and USMCA are different. 
uh, has to do with uh, salaries and labor rights. I think that the way in which uh, USMCA ended up actually happening had to do a lot with how the Democrats realized that you know if they if they kept on postponing you know the the voting of it or if they rejected it this was going to become a great weapon for a great electoral weapon for Trump and on the other hand I mean I, I think the Democrats were very aware of the benefits that a free trade agreement with Mexico has you know has brought to the U.S. Uh, even though you know the 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 accounts are not always positive you know the trade trade agreements are not good or bad across the board. They benefit certain sectors and they, you know, they damage others, right. others on both sides of the border. Now, uh, so I think that you know, the, the premise of NAFTA was that Mexico could be very competitive because of how cheap labor was. I don't think that's the premise of USMCA. Actually, in terms of enforcing labor rights, I think that uh, you know, that premise has, is going to, you know, we need a new premise of, of, of how Mexico is going to insert itself within the North American economy, because I think cheap labor is not going to cut it anymore. Uh, or if, if, you know, if, if Mexican, you know, maquilas or, you know, companies try to, to insist upon that, the, the Americans and the American unions now have instruments to, uh, you know, to, to, to challenge, to challenge that. So on the one hand, we see that, you know, one of the potential effects of the pandemic could be for the U.S. to try to, you know, take away operations or business from China and bring them to Mexico. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure, quite frankly, if Mexico is ready to seize that opportunity, not only because, as I was mentioning, the new terms of our trade agreement of the USMCA, but also because uh, one of the things that China had was a lot of investment in science and technology. Uh, at the beginning of the, of the Chinese boom, of course, it was certainly cheap labor as well. Right. But as China started developing, it was not only a cheap labor. I mean, the, the, the cost of, of labor in China rose and the production costs in China rose. But the, the competitive advantage was still, you know, that China was able to produce, you know, micro components or certain very advanced technology. It has, you know, the labor for the qualified labor force to do that. And I don't think that the current government is actually, you know, setting the foundations for Mexico to seize that opportunity in terms of education, in terms of science and in terms of technology. Uh, so that, that, that worries me because I, I think that this somehow has the, you know, the face or it's, 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 the, it's taking the form of a missed opportunity. Uh, of course, I mean, in a context like this, you know, with the economic emergency is Mex in Mexico, it's really hard, you know, to push for investment sure. in these sort of sectors, you know, when, when you have really a crisis that is gonna, you know, drive millions of people back into poverty, right? I mean, the priorities, are not aligning in a way that could lead Mexico to adopt a much more ambitious and innovative, um, you know, policy, you know, trade related or industrial policy to, to take advantage of this, quite frankly. So, so yes, I'm, I'm, I am pessimistic as well. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's right. really, that's really interesting and, and well said. And, um, you know, I think I'm, you know, on this side of the border too, speaking for, for, from the vantage point of somebody in a university, we, we are worried about, uh, you know, in, in these times, you can make some pretty short-sighted, although politically perhaps understandable, decisions to underinvest in research. And one of the things that, you know, uh, my boss, our president of ASU, Michael Crow, has really been very uh, passionate about is trying to find more ways to collaborate across the border on, on research on, on STEM fields, but also others feeling that that's been a sort of underdeveloped aspect of what's in many ways such a close bilateral relationship. But I wanna, uh, I keep talking about the bilateral relationship in the spirit of USMCA, we have a question from Marie in Montreal that I wanna just throw out. Um, and it's also very future tensey in terms of the subject because she's asking about surveillance tools. Um, 
and how they're going to be normalized as a result of the pandemic, which is really interesting. It's something that we've been paying a lot of attention to just, uh, you know, whether privacy is going to be a, uh, a victim of the pen, one of the victims of the pandemic, just in our everyday lives. But when you think about the border, she's asking, do you foresee these, these, that tracking tools and monitoring tools will be used at the border and, uh, you know, used against my immigrants? Uh, Ali, what, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I would say I would, it, it's a fascinating topic. I'm not, uh, uh, and I love Future Tense work, um, but I love it as a spectator more than that being my area of expertise. I think we can expect that. Uh, I would be very curious. And I think everybody read uh, Harari's piece in the FT where he actually uh, was saying that that's what's going to happen. Uh, I think the technologies are very developed and things are going to start being normalized in the, in the common relationship. I think one of the things that we can't foresee right now, uh, unless we just do a general statement that it's going to change a lot, is our region, as opposed to the European Union, is a region that will hardly work without air travel, right? I mean, in Europe, you can take a train anywhere. Uh, Mexico, Canada, and the United States very hard, uh, not only because we have not invested in, in, train, in, in train lines, but also because it's many more kilometers, it's much bigger, you know? I think it takes the same time to get from Tijuana to Cancun than it takes to get from London to Mos Moscow. So, I mean, it's a very, these are three very large countries. Um, and so I think something like the European integration that not, not, doesn't only depend, and you know, people can just drive through countries, uh, that changes completely in, in North America. And so air travel is central to what we do and air travel is going to change a lot. Um, so I think apart from, from the fact that of course, uh, face recognition technologies might start being used if they're not already, I would be surprised that they're not being used already, uh, but, but much more, let's say, uh, mainstream in, into policy. Um, but I also think that that relationships that don't go through like the the undocumented part of this are also going to change a lot. And, and uh, I wonder how, because I, I really ask myself how we can scale back from nobody goes from one place to the other when what we're seeing and being told by epidemiologists is that this is going to have a rebound that's going to be even worse than what we've just lived. So how we're going to manage that and who's going to be able to travel or who's not uh, is also a big question. That's a, that's a good point. Um, I have another question I want to ask uh, coming from Axel, who is a good friend of ours at Comexi. Um, uh, he has two questions, but in the interest of time, let me skip to his second one. What are your thoughts on uh, Lopez Anamlo's presumed trip to the U.S. to thank Donald Trump for helping Mexico out during the pandemic? Would it mean a win for Trump and a loss for Amlo? Carlos, what do you well, think? Well, I mean, let me divide my answer in two parts. First of all, I think we need to acknowledge that for any Mexican president, not only Amlo, it was also the case with Peña Nieto. And it would be the case regardless of who the person is, you know, uh, in, in the National Palace in Mexico. It is extremely hard for a Mexican president to deal with somebody like Trump in the White House. Uh, no matter how you frame it, no, no matter how you want to present it, Trump is a very difficult character to deal with from a Mexican perspective. So uh, even though I, don't, I, of course, don't like it, I understand to a certain extent this sort of appeasement policy that Lopez Obrador has had regarding Trump. And of course, if you look at uh, Lopez Obrador's d discourse or yeah, when, when he was a candidate, of course he has changed. But well, I mean, I think the, the office in, in many ways should have that effect upon a candidate and you know, make him more realistic in terms of what you can and you can't do. And certainly, you know, Mexico has nothing to win from, you know, Lopez Obrador getting in the ring, in the boxing ring with Donald Trump. So that being said, and you know, the need to find some sort of accommodation with this very incendi incendiary figure is, you know, a must uh, for Mexico. 
foreign policy wise, domestic policy wise, you name it. It's just something that we need to do. Uh, I remember I, I wrote a piece some months ago about how, you know, particularly once the, the electoral campaign started in the US, it was going to be, you know, eat, eat, uh, frog eating season for Mexico. Um, and well, it's, it's just the nature of the game and the, and the place that Mexico has ended up in in American politics is a very toxic place. So we, we're just gonna have to eat the frogs for the time being. Now, about AMLO going to visit and you know, I think there's of course the dimension of a photo op there. I think there's also, you know, that I, I think that uh, Lopez Obrador has tried to cultivate some sort of personal understanding with Trump that has served him well to a certain extent. But uh, I, I disagree with those who have said that, you know, that might help Trump electorally you know, or with the Latino community. Quite frankly, I don't think that, you know, Latinos are, you know, watchful or are, you know, you know um, worried about what the Lopez Obrador position is regarding Trump, quite frankly. I think that, you know, they have their own criteria and their own very legitimate reasons to decide their vote regardless of what happens with Lopez Obrador and Trump. Uh, I don't think they're that connected to, to Mexican politics, quite frankly. I, I think that you know, the, the politics they care about is American politics or Latino politics or Mexican American politics. And in that regard, what AMLO does or doesn't do is you know, anecdotal at best, it's accessory. And I, I don't think it will have a significant impact upon you know, how the Mexican-American community or the Latino community vote come November. So um, we have about 10 minutes, uh, Max. I, I knew this was gonna go by fast, but it went by really fast because you both are, are so interesting. Um, and, and one of the things that I appreciate about both of you, and I should have said this at the outset, is your deep understanding of the US. I mean, Carlos, you, you, you've got a PhD here. And Alexandra, you, you had a high ranking position at the, at the embassy and that's when we first met. And also you, you have the, the, the outsider's perspective. I mean, you know it firsthand, but you also have this sort of outsider's perspective, which is, which is helpful. But um, so we have a little bit of time and I just wanna end with two very tough questions. And if you could both <laughs> address them quickly, um, because at, at, at its core, I think what we often are talking about when we talk about the bilateral relationship is what are we to each other? And I think, you know, it's always been a bit unclear. Mexico, US, you know, for, for, for friends, uh, relatives, uh, there's the old Allen writing, distant neighbors, uh, you know, allies, like, you know, and trading partners has been the, the you know, the, the more recent one. It's, it's, it's a hard relationship to define, right? And um, when, when I think of my childhood in Mexico, the US was the sort of big, uh, you know, the imperio, the scapegoat that was very convenient for Mexicans to sort of, if any, any it was like the all purpose excuse if anything was not going right, well, it's because what do you want? We're, we're stuck next to these, the superpower that abuses us. And, and one of the things that's been really interesting and Carlos, this was a, there was a presentation that one of your colleagues gave uh, when we did our first ASU CIDA event on, uh, one of your colleagues gave a great presentation on the decline in anti-Americanism in Mexico and how it's, Andrew it's escaped from, yeah, it's, 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 yes. it's left the discourse of, of Mexican politics. And, and, I, and I've been impressed with the discipline of AMLO not to go there. Again, we were talking about that. But in terms of like public opinion, um, do, 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 you, do you think, uh, both of you, that we might see a resurgence, uh, maybe we're already seeing it, of anti-Americanism within Mexico? Uh, and then on a personal note for both of you, uh, just to make it even a harder question, do you worry about um, the U.S.? Like, do you, as when you look across the border at your partner, friend, pick your, pick your noun, do you feel like we're just not going to be a, a solid partner for Mexico in the long term? Uh, can, you, can, you, can you make a distinction between fundamentally the country that we are and our current government administration that happens to be there, or is one the reflection of, of the other? Are, are you also pessimistic just on that very fundamental question of what the US is to you and to Mexico? So easy questions for both of you. 
you want to start, Alexandra? Go ahead, Alexandra. Uh, so let me let me start by saying that I would say because we have more than 30 million people, uh, Mexican uh, people in the U.S., I think we can say we're family members. Yeah. Um, we are. We have a large population in the U.S., um, and that is just that, that's the most important aspect of it. I think. Um, because people, that's, that's what's important, right? Um, and then all of the other things, I mean, the integrated value chains and the, and the, and also the cross-culture uh, insemination that we've had from Mexico to the U.S., from the U.S. to Mexico. There's a lot of dimensions in which we could, we could argue that we are much closer than we want to accept. And I think that's something that also says a lot about the, the future of, of the countries more than the future of the relationship. I think the two countries, and, and I know Andres that you did a very inspiring work, something that I've given uh, a lot of thought to, and I think Mexico should do the same. There should be a project uh, mirroring the one that you did on the future of the American dream. Uh, and, the, and, the, and I thought that was fascinating because I think uh, the U.S. has to rethink itself in the light of the new conditions and the new politics and the new policies and the new world order. Um, but on the other, uh, and the new economic reality for everyday people, which is, I think, much more of what that project was about. And I think it, for Mexico, uh, my question, my existential question would be, what, is it, what does it mean to be Mexican? in the 21st century. I think we have a 20th, early 20th century answer to that, that we've been dragging along for a century and a half almost. Uh, but we haven't updated with this new reality that we have, which is, you know, a third of our population is in the US. Uh, we have binationals by the millions. A lot of them are going to be repatriated and probably change the face of Mexico in the medium and long term because they lived some of them most of their lives in the US and will come to Mexico with different ways of living and doing things. Um, but I think we haven't put up to date what what right. you know, culturally we feel that is being Mexican. So I would say, yes, I worry a lot about the US. I would love for the US to go back to some of its core values, which I think are under threat. And that worries me a lot. Uh, I think we all around the world miss some leadership from a country like the US where, when it was able to show the, the best behavior and the best values. Um, but at the same time, we also have to be responsible for our national realities. And, and in that sense, I think Mexico and the US have changed each other dramatically. And we need to just bring that up to date to what we see around us. Okay. Well, I mean, when I was think, I was trying to 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 think about the image that you said, you know, what what do we want this relationship to be? Who who are we, and who are we to each other? And uh, I remember I remembered a very uh, vivid image of uh, you know uh, Ambassador Jeffrey Davido, uh, you know, named his book about his tenure as chief of the diplomatic mission of the U.S. in Mexico at the beginning of, of, of the century. And it was, you know, he sort of crafted this, uh, this little story about a bear and a por porcupine and a hedgehog and a hedgehog saying, um, well, so somehow trying, trying to convey the idea that um, the U.S. was to Mexico sort of a bully that we've become kind of friends with. Uh, but he's still a bully. Uh, but it, it's... He's also a friend. Uh, I remember that the, the, the encounter between these two, these two symbolic animals uh, in which the bear told the hedgehog, you know, I can crush you if I step upon you. And the, the, the answer of the hedgehog was, yes, but you will hurt yourself if you do that. Uh, so I think I mean, this captures wonderfully, like the, on the one hand, the interdependence, but on the other hand, the asymmetry of the relationship, which has been, you know, the key since its very beginning. Uh, I, I, and, and in that regard, uh, I, I think the relationship uh, in a way is, is changing because of the politics, because of the, you know, of the, the economics and, and, and because of, of the social transformation too in the US. One thing that I always 
need to remind myself, and maybe this is because I have ingrained in my brain this sort of early 20th century framework that Alejandra was mentioning, <laughs> is that, you know, it always breaks my little nationalistic heart <laughs> to see that Mexicans in the U.S., uh, the, the sort of relationship that they have with Mexico. You know, in Mexico, we tend to nurture the idea that you know, the deep down inside they're Mexican and that the, their loyalty is with Mexico. Uh, and that is not the case and it shouldn't be the case, quite frankly. I mean, they left, they live there. They have a relationship with Mexico. Uh, you know, they have family here. They, they you know, they speak Spanish. Uh, you know, they, they listen to Mexican music. They drink tequila, whatever, right? But they are Mexican-Americans. Uh, I, I think that should be thought of as an identity of its own. And, and in Mexico, we need to understand that. Somehow, you know, the, the Mexico and the Mexican government still think that we have the monopoly of the voice of Mexico. And that is so not the case, you know. Mexican Americans have their own voice. And, you know, we can talk about if, if they have really, you know, come together and, and become a force to be reckoned with or they are divided. I think, you know, in terms of generations or in terms of income, uh, you know, there are a lot of... Uh, challenges in terms of Mexican Americans becoming, you know, uh, together or, or as my friends in Univision, you know, have always tried to convince us of, you know, the sleeping giant is about to awake. Uh, but, you know, when, when in the moment of truth, they, they don't. And they don't because it's not one sleeping giant. You know, right. it's very different to be a first generation uh, Oaxacan in California than a third generation Zacatecano or Michoacano in Chicago, right? I mean, it's just, it's just how life works, you know? People start, you know, their Spanish is not that good. Their idea of Mexico is, you know, very uh, watered down, is very nostalgic. I mean, I wouldn't, I would of course not question their right to call themselves Mexicans, but I would really challenge the idea that Mexico speaks for them in any sort of meaningful or significant way, you know? Uh, so in terms, I, I think what, one of the things I, I am most interested in is to see how that diversity within the Mexican American community plays out politically in the, in the, you know, in the middle or in the long term. And uh, to go back to what you were asking about Andrew Paxman, yes, I've been very surprised as well with how disciplined AMLO has been not to tap upon uh, anti-American sentiments. But I also think that, you know, AMLO, you know, I, I have a lot of criticisms of AMLO, but one thing I'm not critical of is, you know, in this regard, his political instincts. I think that on the one hand, he's not doing it because there is nothing to, to really gain from it. But I think on the other hand, he's not doing it because one way or another, he knows that that rhetoric will probably not have so much traction yeah. as it would have 30 or 50 years ago. I mean, the integration of both our countries in, in the case of Mexico has really meant that our image and our idea of the US has changed. And, and that change has survived even the Trump administration, I would think. I mean, I, I don't think Mexicans think uh, of the Americans as that other, you know, menacing threat as, as we used to, historically speaking. There's still, of course, and with, with Trump, this has strengthened uh, the, the bully, the bully aspect. But, you know, Mexicans have families in the U.S. They receive remittances. They watch American shows. Many of them speak English. Many of them have traveled there. So, I mean, integration has really make, made its inroads in the Mexican, you know, heart and, heart and soul, or, or no, uh, heart, heart and brain, heart and minds, the hearts and minds of Mexicans, so to speak. And I think it has done so as well in the U.S. There's a sector of the American population in which this hasn't happened, but and, uh, it's a minority. It's a, it's a big minority, but it's still a minority in the U.S. And I think we also need to take stock in Mexico for the long term, that probably our best ally on the other side of the border is that American majority that has changed its image of Mexico as well. Well, that's, that's great. I'm tempted to, uh, to talk more about the, the Mexican American community and identity and how that's shifting and or not shifting and where they fit in, but maybe we could tee that up for our, our next conversation. And, and I was also thinking about Andrew Seeley's great book, Vanishing Frontiers. Yes. And so I, 
I guess that's kind of the big question for the, for the coming years, months, years, decades, is this question of whether the frontiers will continue to vanish or whether we're gonna see a reassertion of, of walls and, and, and boundaries, uh, in, whether in reaction to the immediate crisis or longer term trends. Um, but I think already we, we're sort of getting a sense, uh, I think both of you really fleshed this out nicely that, uh, you know, those of us sitting in like our national capitals can't, shouldn't, should get out of our bubble of thinking that the relationship is all about, you know, two presidents, two governments, two administrations, yes. that at the end of the day, uh, and you both touched upon this quite eloquently, it's, it's about people um, and how over time we've, we have gotten to know each other better and there's still a lot of work to be done on that sense. But um, uh, thank you both so much, Carlos and Alexandra, and thank you. look forward to continuing to, uh, to collaborate with both of you and, and hopefully in, in person sometime soon <laughs> when, uh, when we can, uh, but if not virtually. And I also want to remind everybody- Forward to that, my friend. Really looking forward to yeah. that. And I also want to remind everybody who's been, who uh, tuned in uh, about the Mexico Institute Wilson Center, Comexi conversation tomorrow at four o'clock. With Ambassador uh, Landau, um, go to the Mexico, Mexico Institute uh, at the Wilson Center webpage to RSVP, and hopefully today we provided you with a lot of uh, food for thought uh, to go in to that conversation tomorrow. Um, but thanks, everybody.